All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so that's it, it's the April edition of our uh, undergrad colloquium. So, been managing to keep that going. And um, uh, this time we have one of our own uh, yeah, staff here speaking. So I suppose he doesn't need much introduction for many of you. Scott Morrison, uh, I'm Pierre Portal for those of you I haven't met yet. Undergrad colloquium, many of you know what it is now. It's a talk, so colloquia are talks in my department that are meant to be for the whole department, not just for one specialist team. Undergraduate colloquia, they are talks that are meant for our entire student population, and uh, more often than not, they are, you know, staff also learn plenty of maths by coming to these talks. So, um, what we do is that we have the talk, and after that, we have coffee or drinks, and given the time of the day, there's going to be drinks after. Uh, Scott will be there for a little while. Now, unfortunately, I have to run, so I won't be at that this time, but I'll be at the next ones. And I'm just going to give the floor to Scott, and what he's going to tell us about uh, is everything about quantum mechanics that physicists have been hiding for us. <laughs> Shame for it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, great to have a chance to, to give this talk. Uh, I, I think that uh, Pierre was maybe expecting uh, that I would come along and give an inspiring talk about my research or something like that. Um, there's nothing about my research, my research in here. Really, it's just uh, the, the hour worth of material that I thought it was most important to tell undergraduates because I felt that no one else was telling them. Uh, and uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, as Pierre said, this is an attempt to explain everything you really need to know about uh, quantum mechanics, uh, but without bothering to go and visit the physics department. Um, because quantum mechanics is really a subject in mathematics. It's really just a little tweak on probability theory. Uh, and what I want to emphasize today is really just how small a tweak you need to make on probability theory. So we're going to start by talking for a fair while at the beginning just about classical probability. Uh, we'll formulate that in a particular way, and then we'll just change one little word, and then we'll spend the rest of the talk realizing that that's given us all of quantum mechanics. Well, not all of quantum mechanics, but the quantum probability part. Before I get started, maybe uh, just to let me get a sense of who everyone is, could we just do a quick show of hands? Um, maybe who's in first year? Who's in second year? Third year? Honours? Fourth year? Who's not even under, an undergraduate? <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a, okay, so there's a bit of everyone. Um, I hope that nearly everything here will be understandable to everybody, um, so please Although there will be some words that are intentionally complicated and you're not expected to know, but I'll flag those. Um, so please stop me if things aren't making sense. Okay, so a bit of a preamble, first of all. So we're going to describe the quantum theory of probability as a, as a non-commutative version of the classical theory of probability. And this idea was really one of the first instances of a really pervasive idea in all through 20th century mathematics, which is just that any time you've got some widget that's interesting, you should also go and think about non-commutative widgets, and they'll probably be interesting as well. Uh, for, I'll give you a few examples, but I want to emphasize that, the, that von Neumann's interpretation or language for quantum mechanics, right back at the beginning of, of quantum mechanics, is really the, the, the prototypical instance of, of this idea. And I think it's a bit sad that his version was sort of buried by the physicists, and that in physics departments you get told a very different story about quantum mechanics than this idea. So the next slide is meant to be scary, so uh, don't worry. Um, it's just a list of other places where this idea of non-commutative widgets has turned out to be really important. It doesn't matter if none of this makes sense or you haven't seen it. I just want to advertise a few things. Uh, so quickly, uh, C of x, which to a mathematician just means the continuous functions on some topological space. Well, whatever those things are, it's an example of a commutative C star algebra. And you can take the theory of commutative C star algebras and cross out the word commutative, and then you've got C star algebras, whatever those are. And this, this theme is meant to say, well, you should think of a general C star algebra as some non-commutative analog of topological spaces. I know a handful of you have seen that. Probably most of you haven't. Uh, going on, uh, you can take a Lie group, G, SU2, or something like that, and you can form something called the, the enveloping algebra, maybe if it's Lie algebra. And that gadget you can characterize as some sort of co-commutative Hopf algebra. Again, whatever that is, it doesn't matter. The idea is now we can just cross out this word co-commutative. Co-commutative is something similar to commutative. 
and then we just get some general Hopf algebra. And the idea is that this is some quantum version of the theory of Lie groups. This is the whole subject called quantum groups. Yeah. It's co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-
Now, again, uh, in blue and green is the fancy words, and in, and in uh, orange there's the, the easy case that we need to think about today. But given a, a classical probability space, so that is one of these triples, x and sigma and p, sorry, I think that, that should have been a sigma, I can update it at some point. Okay. Uh, given one of these probability spaces, you can talk about the algebra of observables. Now, it's something complicated if you're doing the general case, but it's basically just functions on your set x valued in the complex numbers. And maybe we ask that they're bounded if our sets are infinite, and maybe we ask that they're sigma measurable, whatever that means, if we've got a sigma algebra. But in a case like this, all of this means is it's just the set of all functions from the set x to the complex numbers. Okay? So in our example, this L infinity gadget of the set 1, 2, 3, 4 is just c to the power 4. It's just four complex numbers, the value of our function on 1, the value of our function on 2, the value of our function on 3, and the value of our function on 4. Okay? So generally, so this is the sort of thing that I want you to think about. If you've got some finite set x, the, the algebra of observables is just c to the power n, where n is the size of that, that set. Okay. But there's also this thing that I'm going to call a state. So a state is some function that takes an algebra on our set and spits out a single complex number. Okay. Now, in this world of, of probability, what that state is going to be is it's going to be the integral of, of that function weighted by those different probabilities. So let's, uh, let's go think about this, this example. Uh, this probability function that I had here, probabilities of different events, corresponds to this function from C4 back to C. So I stick in an element of C4, and I'm thinking here that W is the value of my function on 1, and X is the value of my function on 2, and so on. And it just gives me the integral of this function over this four-point set. That is, it gives me the value of the point 1, weighted by the probability of 1, so that's half times W, plus the value at the point 2, weighted by the probability of the point 2, plus the value at the point 3, weighted by the probability of 3, plus the value at 4, weighted by that zero probability at 4. Yeah? Is there any, any good way of thinking about Notice there are no complex probabilities here. Okay. The, the, the probability function, the p, associates to every event an honest number between 0 and 1. Okay? It's only these functions, these observables, that are complex values. Okay, those, and you're not meant to interpret those as probabilities. So these these uh, these complex valued functions here, you might think um, they they might be like if if your set X is the actual configurations of the real world, these functions might be what's the temperature in Madrid today? They might be uh, what's the largest complex number that someone wrote down on a math 1014 exam yesterday? I mean, they're just they're just things you can measure about the world that might be complex numbers, but they're not at all probabilities. Uh, and then, yeah, then it, okay. right. Yes? Is, is the state, is it sort of like where the thing about the state is evaluating the observable? Yeah, so what is, the, what is the state, this is hopefully on the next slide, but we'll, we'll see. Um, the, here the state was just telling you the expected value of your observable, given this probability of all different events. Okay. So it's, it's just giving you the, the average value of your function weighted by the different probabilities of, of different, different individual events. Okay. So we're now about to do something uh, a bit strange, which is that we're going to try and forget all of this stuff, the underlying set of actual configurations of the world, the list of events that we're allowed to talk about and the probabilities of those events. And we're only going to think about the algebra of observables and the state on it. Okay? We're going to try and re-encode everything we say just in terms of these two gadgets, and we'll never mention the underlying set again. Okay? This is going to be the trick that lets us do quantum stuff. So here's another version of, of what a classical probability space is. Okay. Whew. It consists of a commutative von Neumann algebra. Don't worry about that, because for today we're going to think about finite dimensional algebras, 
and the only finite dimensional commutative von Neumann algebra are C to the n. Okay? So C to the n, you know it, that's a vector space. Uh, who doesn't know what an algebra is in the room? Everyone who's in first year probably is allowed to put up their hand at least. Um, so what, what's a, can, can someone tell me what an algebra is? It's a vector space where you can also multiply. You can also multiply things, okay? And it satisfies the sort of obvious rules for multiplication. And C to the n, that's just the vector space C to the n, has an obvious multiplication, which is just pointwise multiplication. You multiply the first entries, you multiply the second entries, and so on. Okay. Okay. So when I said a classical probability space consists of a commutative von Neumann algebra, for today just think it consists of, of C to the n. Okay? And that, that's all you need to worry about. And then a state. Well, a state is some gadget that behaves like that expectation value function. The, on the previous slide, we had this, this guy, um, I think I called it mu again, that told me the expected value of any observable. But we want to keep that. So mu is meant to be uh, something that takes an element of this algebra and spits out a number. And we're going to interpret that as the expected value of that observable. Okay? So connecting to the previous page, uh, when we actually had a set, an underlying set x, our algebra A is just all of the functions, complex valued functions on that set. So what, what properties do we want uh, these expected values to, to have? Well, we want to say that it's linear. So if you, if, if you add two different elements of this algebra, you should get out the sum of the expected values. Okay, that's a pretty reasonable thing about expected values. Similarly for scalar multiplication, if you double some element of the algebra, you should, the, the expected value should double as well. Uh, our algebra should have uh, a, a unit, that is a, something you can multiply by that doesn't change anything. In the case on the previous page of functions on a set, that's just the function that's equal to 1 everywhere on the set. Or when we're thinking about c to the n, it's just the function that's 1 in every entry. Okay? And if you've got a function that's just 1, that's always 1, what's its expected value? Well, it doesn't matter what the probability distributions are. The expected value of the constant function 1 is always 1. So that's another rule we impose about our state. Okay? The, the expected value of the constant 1 function has to be the number 1. And then there's this other condition, which is a little bit technical, uh, but we'll come back to in a moment. It says that, uh, well, first of all, there's this funny star here. So in particular, we're saying that on this algebra A, the, oh, sorry, poor notation, this A here is in a different font than that A there. I should, have, I should have fixed that. This is a curly A, and it's the whole algebra. Okay? And this A is an element of that algebra. I should have used a different letter completely. Okay. So first of all, we've got this star, which says we can take an element of the algebra and produce some other element of the algebra. And all you really need to know is that in this example of C to the n, it's just complex conjugation of all of the, all of the complex numbers. Okay. So you take, if you, this is just saying if you take any element of the algebra, and you complex conjugate it, and you multiply it by itself, its expected value is not any old complex number, but actually a non-negative real number. And we'll see why that's important on the next slide. But for now, we're just trying to axiomatize how expected values of observables behave. Okay, they're linear, the expected value of the constant one function is one, and then this funny one, the expected value of a star a is non-negative. Okay. Let's try and make sure that we understand all of the states on the commutative algebra C to the n. Well, okay. First and foremost, a state has to be, remember, a linear map from C to the n to C. And the only linear maps from C to the n to C are things that look like this. Mu of v, that's some vector in C to the n, looks like v dot w, but this is just the inner product of v with some other vector w. So it's v1 times w1 plus v2 times w2 plus up to vn times wn, where w is some fixed vector in c to the n. Okay, that's just what linear functions from c to the n to c look like. All of them are like that. Okay. Now, we can just go through the other conditions for states. In the algebra of c to the n, the multiplicative, in, uh, the multiplicative identity is just the, the, the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And so if we look at mu of that and check that that's equal to 1, we'll just plug this guy into that formula for v, and you just see that the sum of the entries of w has to equal 1. Okay? Now, the, we get to the slightly scary one. So the star operation on c to the n is complex conjugation. So vectors that look like a star a for some a 
are just exactly those vectors who don't have complex entries, but who have non-negative real entries, okay? So all that we're saying is that if you, if you take mu and you stick in a vector with non-negative real entries, you better get something that's non-negative and real, okay? And it's pretty easy to see that that forces that each of the wi's are also non-negative and real. If you had, if, some of your, if one of your wi's was complex or negative, you would just look at um, kind of this corresponding ei, the basis vector with that same i, stick that in here, and you'd get out a number that was also complex or negative whatever. Okay. So what did we learn? We learned that a state on c to the n is some list of numbers w1 through wn. They add up to 1. They're all non-negative and real. Okay. And that's exactly just putting a probability measure on the set 1 through n. Okay. It's assigning a non-negative real number to each, each number 1 through n, so they add up to 1. Okay. The states on c to the n are the exact same thing as probability measures on the set 1 through n. How do people feel about that? Who's angry? Who's upset? Okay. Um, ask questions now if you want to. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So we've understood what all the states on C to the n look like. Okay. So we're almost ready to do all the quantum mechanics. On the next slide, I'm going to tell you all all the quantum mechanics. Okay. So let's just remember what we've said so far. A classical probability space is a commutative von Neumann algebra A, and for example, you could just take C to the n with pointwise multiplication. Along with the state, mu from the algebra to the complex numbers, which is linear, for mu of 1 is 1, and mu of A star A is nothing. And for example, you could take mu of V, so V mu is in C to the n, it's V dot W, where W is some, non, is some probability distribution on the numbers 1 through n, i.e. an n tuple of non-negative real numbers. Okay. So just uh, some interpretation here. We're thinking of the element uh, of an element f in this algebra. Well, sorry. Uh, you call an element of, it, of this algebra an observable. And secretly, we're thinking of it as just some function on that set x that we had back on the very first slide. Okay, But we remember we're trying not to mention the set x. We're only talking about the algebra. So secretly, we're thinking of elements of the algebra as functions on some underlying set, that x at the beginning. Okay, And the state mu represents our knowledge of the system, that is mu of f, is the expected value of the observable f given our current knowledge. That is, it's the, it's the average value uh, over the set x with respect to that probability measure. But I really have to put this bit in quotes because we're not thinking about the set x and probability measures, we're just thinking about the algebra and the state. So we interpret mu of f as the expected value of an observable. Okay. So what's, what's, what's quantum probability now? You can probably guess from the, the lead in the first slide all that we have to do now. Does someone want to tell me what we have to do to get a quantum probability space? Cross yeah, we just cross our commutative and we've got quantum probability space. <laughs> Great. OK. So a quantum probability space consists of a von Neumann algebra A, not necessarily commutative, and a state satisfying exactly the same list of axioms as before. So let's have some examples. Well, now that our von Neumann algebras don't have to be commutative, there are lots more examples. And the simplest and best example you should think of is just the algebra of two by two matrices, complex matrices. So these guys, what can we do with them? We can